Hey guys, Mr. Mark with you. In this video, we're going to look at the lab we're going to do next time in class on what is known as Hooke's Law. So let's investigate how we use springs to measure forces. So a force is not really something that we can measure directly. So we have to figure out a way to measure a force by measuring something else that can serve as a proxy for a force. And this is one of our ideas from our boy Galileo. Measure what we can, and then what we can't measure, figure out a way to measure it. So the law that we're exploring is known as Hooke's Law. Robert Hooke was a um, scientist of stores. He dabbled in a lot of different things, including astronomy. Um, you probably learned about him a little bit in biology. He was kind of one of the first people to look at really small things under microscopes and kind of draw detailed drawings of what he saw and try to use microscopes to figure out what little things were made out of. Um, he was a rival of Isaac Newton's. In fact, he accused Isaac Newton of stealing a lot of his work. And so a lot of what we call Newton's laws might have actually been Robert Hooke's laws. Um, this particular law is known as Hooke's law specifically because he published it as an anagram, as a challenge. Like, hey, here's a bunch of scrambled letters. If you can unscramble them, then I'll let you have credit for this law. And then a year later, he unscrambled the anagram into a Latin phrase, ut tensio sic vis, which is kind of what we're exploring here today. So that phrase, when unscrambled, basically means as the extension, so the force. And it refers to springs. Springs are things that can be stretched or compressed. Some do both, although we don't have any of those here at Graybone High School. Um, and so the hypothesis that we're going to be testing based on this claim from Robert Hooke is that the stretch of a spring is proportional to the force that it exerts. So we're going to take some springs, we're going to stretch them out with known forces, and see if we can get a linear relationship between the force that the spring exerts and the amount of stretch that the spring has. So the first thing that we need to do is get some known forces. And the easiest way to do that is to go to the physics storeroom and get some calibrated masses. Whenever you use these things, you want to call them calibrated masses. Like they have a known mass that's been very carefully calibrated um, by a manufacturer in a lab. Um, we can attain the weight or the gravitational force on these guys simply by multiplying the mass in kilograms by the gravitational field strength. And you want to write this value down. It's a very important number. On Earth, the gravitational field strength is 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Let's do a real quick example of how you do that. So let's suppose that you pull from that set the 200 gram mass. Uh, your first move is to convert that mass to kilograms. There are 1,000 grams in a kilogram, so you simply set up a ratio or fraction and divide 200 by 1,000 to get 0 0.2 kilograms. Anytime you have a mass in physics, go ahead and convert it to kilograms. That is the base SI unit that we're going to use. Then to find the weight of that mass, or the gravitational force, simply multiply the kilograms by the gravitational field strength, on Earth, that's 9.8 newtons per kilogram, and then you get the weight of 1.96 newtons. Newtons is our unit that we're going to use for force, named after a guy you might have heard of called Isaac Newton. And so anytime you have a mass, convert it to kilograms, and then if we need the gravitational force, just multiply by 9.8. The other thing we need to do is measure how much our spring stretches. So what we're going to do is we're going to hang those different calibrated masses from a spring that is supported by a stand, and then just measure how far the spring is stretched. A meter stick would be a really good tool to use for something like that. So the last thing that we need to talk about, and we need to think about this anytime we are doing measurements in the lab, is how do we reduce the experimental uncertainty? The first thing that we can do is repeat our trials. For things like links, like we're doing in this lab, that's really not terribly helpful. Um, the second thing we can do is do many different trials. So we're going to vary something, which is a pretty good idea in this lab since we want to determine a relationship between two variables. So if there is a relationship between the stretch of a spring and force, then we need to do different forces to get different stretches of springs. So we're going to do at least 10 different trials here, so 10 different weights hanging on our spring. We want to try to spread those out over as long, large a range as possible. So we want to do some 
trials that barely stretch the spring, and we want to do some that make it stretch by as long a length as possible. Those things will go all the way to the table uh, if you put enough weight on them. And then lastly, we're going to graph our data. That's going to give us a better picture than just a table by itself. And we can use the slope of the best fit line from our graph to get a good average of the values that we're dealing with. And so those are going to be the ways that we reduce the experimental uncertainty in this lab. Do many trials over as long a range as possible, and then graph our data to get a better picture of what it looks like. So that's it for our Hooke's Law Lab. So follow other directions as indicated by your teacher, and I'll see you when I see you. Ta-ta.